Welcome back to the Word on Fire Institute lecture series, The Idolatry of Identity, Progressive Wokist Ideology, and the Catholic Response. The previous lecture examined Catholic social thought's answer to progressivism's problem with being able to speak truth. In this lecture, we turn to how Catholic social thought can respond to progressivism's dangerously utopian tendencies and its inability to articulate a universally equal conception of human dignity. Progressivism tends towards utopianism, the belief that society can be perfected or nearly perfected if the right social policies are enacted and enforced, because it contains no limiting principle, either at the level of epistemology, what can be known, or at the level of, of anthropology, the potential perfectibility of human nature. Because knowledge is determined exclusively by identity groups' lived experiences, with the additional proviso that, that that experiential knowledge must be unquestionably accepted as true by non-group members, particularly if they are, are deemed to be oppressors, identity groups can continually recalibrate their experiences to demand ever greater political concessions. For example, despite the fact that there is strong empirically verifiable evidence that U.S. society has made substantial and abiding progress in combating the evils of racism, and also despite substantial empirical evidence that American police do not in fact disproportionately use unjust force against black individuals, the, the identitarian politics at the heart of progressive ideology take it as a matter of undisputed dogma that American society is as racist as it ever has been. As a consequence of its relativistic view of truth, progressivism shuts down all avenues of rational scrutiny into the contents of its claims and therefore can make unending demands on society to fulfill its limitless vision of social perfection. Now, this epistemic shape-shifting is, is dangerous enough on its own, yet combined with the power of progressivism's Manichaean anthropology, all the necessary ingredients for outright totalitarianism fall into place. Within this anthropological paradigm, progressivism tends to divide individuals, whatever personal particularities might define them, and whatever actions they, they, they may or may not have committed in their lives, into one of two categories. Good, which typically corresponds with being non-white, non-heterosexual, non-male, non-cisgendered, non-immigrant, etc., and, and bad, uh, which typically corresponds with being white, heterosexual, cisgendered, native-born, etc. This is not a, a sensationalistic exaggeration or hyperbolic charge of reverse discrimination in the key of Robin DiAngelo's white fragility. Contemporary progressivism rhetorically attacks whiteness and, and other associated hegemonic and oppressive characteristics in ways that are analogous to how Stalin described the Kulaks, whom he largely exterminated, how the ethnic Hutu described the ethnic Tutsis, which eventually led to the Rwandan genocide, and how ethnic Turks have described ethnic Armenians, which despite Turkish government efforts to block the designation as such, led to genocide in the early 20th century. Think of it this way. Though he was temporarily fired from Viacom CBS for his comments, the the company later rehired him as a host for a new show called Wild and Out. Nick Cannon, a former co-host of America's Got Talent, one of the most mainstream shows on American television, felt sufficiently emboldened to share the following views in a 2020 interview. Speaking of white people and Jews, he said, quote, they're acting out of fear. They're acting out of low self-esteem they're acting out of a deficiency. So therefore, the only way they can act is evil. They have to rob, steal, rape, kill in order to survive. So then these people that didn't have what we have, and when I say we, I speak of the melanated people, they had to be savages. I say all that to say the context in which we speak, whether it's Jewish people, white people, Europeans, the Illuminati, they were doing that as survival tactics to stay on the planet. We never had to do that." Unquote. Now, notice the moral difference 
canon mar marks between we, the melanated, and the Jewish and white, they. There's uh, no interpretation or connecting of the dots or making the implied explicit here. The former host of America's Got Talent believes it is legitimate to say in public that Jews and white people are evil for no other reason than because they are Jews and white people. Sadly, this is not an isolated event, as the Smithsonian Guide to Whiteness examined previously and many, many other similar instances demonstrate. Among wide swaths of contemporary culture, entertainers, teachers, business leaders, professors, and even government officials are eager to denounce groups of individuals for indelible characteristics that they have never chosen nor could possibly choose. That used to be called racism. Now it's called social justice. And we all know how this progressive shadow version of a morality tale, a tale of good and evil, not told in the language of conflicting ideas, but in conflicting peoples, ends. Once you start seeing evil in a group, you'll soon start to speak that evil, first in private, but then, once it becomes acceptable, in public. And, and once you start speaking that evil in public, you're going to start calling for someone to do something about it. And once enough people start making the same call, a, a critical mass forms, to implement a solution to the problem. A solution whose only form, by the very logic of Manichaean anthropology, can be the removal of the source of evil from society. The good groups of people must suppress, if not purge, the bad groups of people. Identitarian justice, justice, can call for nothing less. The Catholic social thought tradition, in contrast, brooks no such division among human beings. First, it, it vehemently rejects the claim that some groups have access to a, a special knowledge that is otherwise inaccessible to others outside that esoteric group of right knowers. This belief in the existence of special knowledge and of a special people who can know this special knowledge is, is just another expression of Gnosticism. And the church has been fighting Gnosticism since its very inception. Second, Catholic social thought's understanding of original sin prevents any individual or group of individuals from claiming moral superiority by dint of birth or race or sex or ethnicity or any other indelible characteristic for which the individual is not responsible. It is human action and the character generating that action alone that determines guilt and innocence and viciousness and virtue. And even within the recognition that individuals can choose to be better or worse persons, and societies can make choosing to be a good person easier or harder, is the even more fundamental recognition that, in St. Paul's words, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Just as no individual can declare himself or herself free from sin, neither can any group. In sum, for the Catholic social thought tradition, all human beings, without exception, are made morally equal in the image and likeness of God, and all human beings, without exception, are mired in sin, chief among them the sin of pride. We can and should, as individuals, do everything possible to avoid the temptations of our broken nature. We can and should, as societies, also do everything possible to prevent the temptations of our broken nature from becoming socialized and, and encrusted in injustice, including, but by no means limited to, racial injustice. We should become the best we can in all our complex diversities, moving closer to the kingdom of God, but without forgetting for a moment that we are not gods and that it is in the end not our kingdom to achieve. Having chosen sin, we have chosen to break ourselves, every one of us. God help us, the Catholic social thought tradition teaches, from ever falling into the progressive delusion that we can completely fix ourselves, or even worse, that we can fix them by creating a perfect temporal society. In addition to flirting with totalitarian utopianism, progressivism also, and relatedly, it pulls the rug out from under equal and universal human dignity. 
I, I just explained how progressivism uh, imposes a moral bifurcation on human beings, uh, dividing us into camps of good and evil. Well, this division cuts all the way down into the bedrock of human worth, opening the door for the possibility that some lives are more valuable than other lives. For example, the contemporary toxification of the claim, all lives matter, is emblematic of the progressive willingness to abandon the belief that all human beings are morally equal by virtue of being human and being human alone. Indeed, according to progressive ideology, the affirmation that all lives matter can itself be racist, meaning that it demeans the value of black individuals. If that also sounds nonsensical, by definition, all lives is inclusive of black lives, recall that progressive ideology authorizes itself the power to redefine both logical relationships between terms and the meaning of those terms themselves. To be fair, some progressive activists argue that while they agree with the content of the claim, all lives matters, uh, using the term in political discourse obscures the specific injustices suffered by black people. This response, however, is a, is a non sequitur. There's nothing mutually exclusive about believing all lives matter on the one hand, and there is racial injustice specifically against black individuals on the other. One can hold both ideas at the same time without contradiction. Thus, the silencing of the public expression of saying all lives matter so much so that people have been fired for writing it on their private social media accounts is purely political in nature, serving as a rhetorical weapon against the expression of views that an identity group finds inimical to its political interests. Even worse, however, removing all lives matter from acceptable mainstream political discourse undercuts the idea of universal human dignity and correspondingly universal human equality. The Catholic social thoughts tradition's view of dignity as both objective and universal remains steadfast, however. Indeed, it supplies the necessary moral logic and motivation for why we as individuals and societies should fight against injustice towards any individual or group. If all lives don't matter equally, then only some injustice counts. And if only some injustice counts, some lives can be disposed of without concern or recourse. To be sure, when an identity group is, is experiencing political ascendancy, the, the belief that all lives matter may seem dispensable, if not an obstacle, to gaining greater power. But when, not if, when another group begins clamoring that it is their lives that matter the most and that, that, that they start gaining power based on that claim, the belief that all lives matter will start coming in handy again. For these reasons, the Catholic social thought tradition recognizes that the best way to protect minorities from tyrannical majorities is to hold fast to the belief in equal human dignity. It recognizes that equal dignity, because it is the truth about human beings, independent of whatever particular identities we may have or ascribe to. In sum, upholding universal human worth protects us all. And the moment it becomes controversial to say all lives matter is the moment when everybody's lives become most vulnerable. In the next and final lecture, we'll examine progressivism's problem with evading hypocrisy and how it undermines freedom of speech. We'll then conclude with the Catholic response both to these problems and to the overarching issue that bedevils the entire progressive wokus enterprise, the idolatry of group identity. See you next time.